Well, good morning, everybody. Awesome. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Well, it was very interesting one day when uh, Pastor Susie asked me to, to preach today. And the first thing I did was look at my calendar. I figured I had something going on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, you know, the reality is the Holy Spirit was dealing with me on something. The Holy Spirit was uh, working with me on uh, an area in my life that I needed to fine tune. I need to get back in shape. The Lord was talking to me about exercising my faith. Um, exercising, to exercise your faith, you know, the, the Christian life is a journey. And we are to walk in it, and we're to make a consistent forward progress in our faith. Um, I don't know, we, I have some slides, and I'm not sure if it's working. Oh, there we go. So first, let me pray before I get going, because this is something the Lord is working on me, and I'm preaching to myself here. And so I want to make sure that what I'm saying is what God is saying to me. So, dear Lord, we just come before you. We thank you. And God, I just, I thank you for this church. I thank you for all the people in this church and how precious they are to me and how precious they are to you. So, Lord, I just lift up this message that you've been working on me and, and putting in my heart, Heavenly Father God, and I just pray that it is your words, not mine. And I thank you for all the prayers that have already been lifted up. I thank you for everyone else who's been interceding on my behalf, that what I present will be not from me, but from you. And I give you all glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So on May 22nd, if all of you or some of you were here, was uh, the last day of the revival, um, Pastor Susie, Pastor Susie gave, and she talked about the Holy Spirit. And I thought it was interesting uh, that, that presentation about the Holy Spirit, because I didn't know anything about that. But it's so awesome, and it's so true that the Holy Spirit, when it comes upon you, it gives you power. The Holy Spirit transforms your life. You know, and... You know, I've experienced that transformation power. And I know many of you have as well. And Pastor Susie gave some great examples of how the Holy Spirit was used to transform different areas and different countries. But then she also said that we still have free will. And, you know, a lot of times we, we come to Christ and we accept Christ and we think that that's it. And we just kind of move forward. You know, um, it's interesting. A lot of non-Christians believe that Christians don't have troubles. You know, I, have an, I had an atheist co-worker. And I was talking to him. And he was sharing with me all his troubles and all the things that he went through. And, you know, and I was kind of relating to him some of the stuff I went through. And he was surprised. He said, what? You're a Christian. You have troubles? I said, yeah. Yeah. I have troubles. I just have someone I know who, who I can go to. And, and I think a lot of the times non-Christians think that Christians don't have troubles because we have Christ in us and we have the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in us that gives us peace in the midst of our troubles. You know, and, and sometimes it's unfortunate, but there are Christians who don't believe we should have troubles. Um, and I've had a few friends who have encountered troubling times. And then they ask, where's God? You know, I did my part. I said a prayer. Where's God? And unfortunately, these friends are no longer working, walking with Christ. Because they thought when they experienced Christ, when Christ came into their lives, and when they experienced the working of the Holy Spirit, that was it. That the... God is just going to take us through everything. And there's no work on our part. But what we read in Timothy, we read in 1 
Timothy. Oh, make sure I know what I'm doing here. Okay. Um, might have to advance it to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 10 says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For the whole body, um, for the whole body training is of some value, but godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying uh, is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe. And we look at these action words. The action words are train or training and toil and strive and we realize the Christian walk isn't, it's not just a passive walk. When we walk in Christ, when we become a Christian, you know, there is a work on our part. We actually have to make an effort. You know, when we come to Christ, yes, we have faith. Our faith in Christ is that I have sinned. I've accepted Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. And I know that God loves me. I know that God cares for me. But then a lot of times that's where it ends. You know, you go about your daily life knowing that God loves and cares for you, but we don't, sometimes don't pursue him like we should. To. He wants to have a personal relationship with us. He wants us to know him as much as he knows us. And in Paul... He compares the Christian walk uh, to that of an athlete. You know, an athlete really has to work. An athlete has to prepare. And we are to sp spiritually prepare like an athlete. You know, when, when you look at an athlete and you, let's say, look at the Olympics or whatever, and you look at someone on the balance beam, it looks natural. They look like they were born doing it. You know, you, you look at someone um, on the rings or whatever it might be. You know, I, I think of uh, um, what, ice skating or whatever. Ugh. You know, <laughs> I, I, I watch them and it looks like, okay, they've been doing this all their life. I, I went to an ice rink once and I, I, I tried to do some ice skating. No. People are not meant to be skating around in a little blade. That is not, that's not right. You know? It, but they make it look like it's natural. The reason it looks natural is because they put time and effort. They work at it until it becomes natural. You know, the Christian walk is, is really no different. We have to put time and effort until our walk becomes natural. When everybody looks at us, when everybody sees us, it needs to be natural. Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that, I uh, that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes and the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, and I make it my slave so that after I have preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Right? You know, we, we are like athletes, Christianity. You know, sometimes people don't 
think of that. You know, I, I don't think of that. But when God was speaking to me, he's like, you need to be in spiritual training. You know, you need to exercise that faith. You know, it's not just you come to Christ, you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, and then that's it. You go about your daily life. You know, sometimes people ask, oh, what have you been up to? I'll say, work, church, sleep, and eat. <laughs> you know? It's like, but unfortunately, a, a lot of us, and even myself, kind of get into that habit. You know, it's work, church, sleep, and eat. No, it needs to be more than that. You know, what are we doing? How are we, how are we exercising our faith? You know, athletes train in order to compete at the highest level. They train in order to compete. We're in competition daily. We, a lot of times we don't know it, but we're competing. We have opposition. You know, golf is one of those sports that I find very boring. You know? I mean, when a, when a golfer, when, if you watch golf, it's pretty boring because they hit a ball. It goes a certain distance, lands on some grass. They follow it up. They hit it again. It's okay. You know, but one of the reasons I think it's so boring is because they are good. You know, just imagine if they would show people who aren't any good. My goodness, would that be exciting? I might watch golf. You know? You have people, the gallery or whatever, who are lined up, and they are trusting that these golfers are going to hit it where they're aiming. They're lying all up on the side. I, I'm thinking to myself, I, I wouldn't be there. But if you, if you had people who weren't any good, man, that would be exciting. People would be dodging. You know, they'd be all over the place. You know, have people with helmets on. You see most of the golfers in the woods trying to hit out of the woods, breaking clubs, hitting trees, you know. I say, wow, that would be exciting, you know. It would be more like an action sport. You know, but the problem is, for me, they're good. It's boring, you know. I, I had a friend who I played racquetball with, and he wanted me to try golf. And I said, oh, okay. He took me to Kicking Bird, um, to the driving range, and over on this side were the good golfers, people who knew how to hit the ball. He took me way away. <laughs> in a separate section. He said, okay, you know, here, just we'll practice hitting the ball. You know, I was, I'd seen golf on TV. It's gotta be easy. You know, I, I swing, I miss, okay. I, was like, you know, I got good hand-eye coordination. I can play racquetball. You know, I can hit that little blue ball as it's zooming along at 100 miles an hour. I couldn't hit the stationary ball. I swing and swing and swing, and I just couldn't hit it right, and then finally, Whack! I connected. Man, I felt great. Except the ball didn't go where I wanted it to go. It went straight in front of all the other golfers. <laughs> I mean, it was a scary scene. And he quickly said, I, I, let, "Let's practice pr practice putting." <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, and I haven't heard from him since. <laughs> I mean, see, you know, that was it. You know, we haven't played racquetball, nothing. That was it. But it was hard, you know? Something that people who put time and effort and work hard at it make it look so easy. It wasn't that easy. You know, um, VJ Singh, if anybody knows who he is, he's a professional golfer. And he had a fan, fan come up to him one time and, and told him, oh, oh, I wish I could play like you. And he told the fan, no, you don't. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. He said, no, you don't. He said, you know, I open the driving range and I close it. I thought you ought to know. You know, he, he said, I work hard because I love it. You know, I, I practice because I enjoy it. And he said, I don't go into the hotel. I don't go back and, you know, I don't have drinks and I, I don't talk and gossip. And basically what he's telling the fan is, if you really wanted to be like me, you would put in the effort. It's like, you don't want to be like me because you're not putting in the effort. If you did, you would put in the effort. You know, and it's sad because there are Christians out there who will say, I want to be like Christ. 
I want to be like Christ. And they mean it, you know. I'm sure that man meant to what he said. He wanted to be like BJ. But people say, I want to be like Christ. But then they don't put in the effort. You know, it takes effort. If we look at Scripture and we see what Jesus went through, what did Jesus do? He studied his father's word. He's, he, he became like us. And he studied God's word. He spent time in prayer. He spent time listening to his father. In order to be like him, you have to do like him. You're not going to just be like Christ. And when trials come, are you going to be able to beat the opposition? You know, I'm not a basketball player. I don't pretend to be. I, I'm more like a, a bull in a china closet. You know, when I've tried to play basketball, I only have one direction, that's forward, and that's it, you know. So you're not going to see me moving and juking, no, no, that ain't going to happen. But let's say, for instance, I want to become a basketball player, and I get on a basketball team. By all rights, I'm a basketball player, right? I'm on the team, I'm a basketball player. Now, I might be warm in the bench because I'm no good, but I'm a basketball player. If I don't spend time training, if I don't spend time putting in the effort, if I don't spend time exercising, if they put me in the game, I'm no good. I'm helping nobody. I'm not helping the team. All I'm going to do is foul out because I keep running into everybody. Right? The question is, as Christians, are we Christian bench warmers? Are we sitting on the side just expecting that someone else is going to get in and win the game. The reality is we are all called to be in the game. We're all going to be called up. There's not a Christian here that is not going to be called up to play in the game. We can't be Christian bench warmers. We can't be bench warmers for Christ. You know, oh, I'm a bench warmer for Christ. You know, no one's going to wave a sign like that, right? No, we have to get in the game. So if we're going to get in the game, we have to be prepared. Amen. You know, I've, uh, I've heard people say this, and this is one of the things that I remember talking to my dad, one of the things that really, really got on his nerves. But people would say, you know, oh, we sin every day. Oh, we sin all the time. Oh, you know, we can't help. You know, that's not true. That's not true. We have the powerful working of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us to help us and assist us to overcome sin. We have to do our part. We have to meditate on the Word. We have to know the Word. You know, um, last Sunday, Pastor Susie gave a great message on sin, and she gave great spiritual references that the Word of God tells us that we are not to continue therein. Amen. You know, so if you haven't seen her message last Sunday, which was, you know, talking about gorillas and, and apes and all those type of things, you know, you can go on uh, lakeviewpark.org Lakeviewpark and you can look at her message. And, you know, she clearly explains that we are not bound to it. Amen. But... In order to be an overcomer, we have, to be a, we have to exercise and prepare so that when the temptation comes, we already know what to do. We will react naturally. You know, God's grace, God gave us grace, right? A lot of people think, oh, God gives us grace to sin. No, he doesn't. God's grace was so that we can enter into his presence. God's grace was to be able to forgive us of our sins. God's grace was for us to overcome sin, not to continue in it. And that takes effort on our part. Um, are we spiritually equipped? Are we equipping ourselves spiritually? You know, we need to have a routine, just like an athlete. You have to have an exercise routine. We need to have a spiritual exercise routine. What are we doing? You know, and this is where God was working on me. 
you know, things in my life, things have changed, things have gone topsy-turvy, and, you know, I got out of my routine. You know, we have COVID. And instead of going into work, I'm working from home. And at work, I had a, a, a accountability partner, which we would pray together. We had set aside times that we'd get together and pray. You know, I would, on Mondays, I would go straight from work over to the Campbell's house and enjoy fellowship and prayer. You know, I, I had a routine of a men's group that met in my house. And, you know, but all these things with my dad passing, with changes in work schedules, so I haven't been able to attend the, the prayer group, and all these different things, I've allowed my routine to slip. And God is dealing with me. He was pointing his finger in my chest, basically, you know, when I was trying to look excuses to get out of preaching. He said, no, I'm dealing with you on this. Maybe someone else might need to hear it. I need to get my routine back in, back together. I need to have that spiritual routine daily in the word. I need to daily be in prayer. You know, daily in worship, in, in meditation on the word. Meditation is more than just reading the word. You're dwelling on it. You're hiding it in your heart. And the fellowship, we need fellowship, one with another. And then we need rest. Rest in Christ. There was a, um, a mixed martial arts fighter. Does anybody know mixed martial arts? Okay. There was a mixed martial arts fighter. His name was Oliver in camp, and Oliver in camp was uh, he was scheduled to fight in this one competition, and he was an underdog. He was expected to lose, but he won, spectacular fashion. He won, and here's what he had to say after that victory. Oh, we don't have sound. Okay. Well that the regular fan sees. Uh, and that is the struggles of the fight here. Because a fight like this, uh, it's not just that you train hard and you go there and fight and you knock someone out and then you're the king of the world. Uh, that's only on the surface. But if you scratch on the surface and go deep beneath, the, the preparation starts a month in advance. And uh, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a tough journey every time, and there's different ways of handling it because it's different kind of stresses on your body. So obviously it's a physical stress, preparing the conditioning and everything. And uh, maybe you have been doing sparring, wrestling and stuff at, at your gym, uh, but the exhaustion levels that you get in a fight, they're like tenfold that you can ever gain in training because of all the, the tension and the nerves that you have going into this fight, so everything just becomes so much more heavy and tough. Uh, so all the training needs to, to be uh, pushed to its limits uh, a, a weeks in advance. So basically what he's saying is, you have to be prepared. You know, we exercise, we train intensely so that we are ready when the opposition comes. We are, when we are in the middle of the fight, it's too late to get prepared. And what is your reaction when you are set, when an opposition suddenly comes against you? Right, when, when you're driving and you know, my mom, God bless her, she, is there when I'm driving a lot of times when I, so she helps me <laughs> to kind of quell what my reactions might be. If I'm in the fast lane and there's a slow person blocking, you know, my reaction when I'm alone might be a little different, you know, but thank the Lord when I'm with my mom, you know, I kind of hold it back. But, I mean, the, but the reality is we are always, we're always going to encounter some kind of opposition. Satan is always out there to cause us to trip up, 
He wants us to trip up, you know? Yeah, okay, driving, that's a little thing, that gets you frustrated, but what happens when something dramatic occurs? What is your reaction? You know, uh, many of you might know about Corey Ten Boone, and there's, um, uh, I forgot the name of the book, but there's a section, you know, thank you for the fleas, thank the Lord for the fleas. If you, if you don't know about that, look it up. Look it up on YouTube, look it up wherever. Um, but it's a reaction that Corrie Ten Boone's sister, when they were in the, in the concentration camp, they were in a concentration camp, and they were just covered with fleas. But her sister's reaction, she wasn't upset. She said, thank the Lord for the fleas. Excuse me? You know, they're sleeping, there's fleas, the fleas they get in their mouth while they're sleeping. It's just horrible. But she was thanking the Lord for the fleas because none of the soldiers would come around because there's so many fleas. They were able to worship God. They were able to, to pray. They were able to in, encourage the other Jewish um, concentration camp members, if you will. They were able to encourage them in Christ and lead several to Christ that they wouldn't have had the freedom to do. You know, when opposition comes against me, if that was me, I don't know if I'd be thanking the Lord for the fleas. But you have to be spiritually prepared because when those things come, you know, how are you going to react? So one of the greatest examples, of course, is Jesus Christ. You know, when he was at his lowest, what was his reaction when Satan came against him, when he was at his weakest? So it was when Jesus was led, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. I said, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word, by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Satan is using scripture, for it is written. He shall command angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. That is the example of Christ. He spent time with his father. We see through scripture where he would separate himself to be in the presence of his father. He spent time reading the word. He knew the word. You know, he was equipped at his lowest point when he was weak. He was quick to be able to respond. It did, he didn't have to think about it. You know, Mike Tyson, many of you have heard of him. Mike Tyson, at his prime, was a boxer who would just, he would beat pretty much, he would beat everybody. He was undefeated, right? And people would get upset because they would pay 50 bucks for this pay-per-view. They'd go and get popcorn. I don't know why you would leave. But they'd go and get popcorn. they come back, and he's already knocked out his opponent. You know, people were wanting to get their money back. You know, because, oh, man, I can't believe it. You know, sit there and watch. Why would you leave? But, <laughs> but, you know, he was at the height of his, of his um, physical peak or whatever when he fought Buster Douglas. Right? And as we know, you know, when he fought Buster Douglas, he not only didn't beat him, he was expected to beat him. He was expected to knock him up, but not only did he not beat him, it went to the 10th round, which was unexpected, and then Buster Douglas knocked him out. 
You know, and what was the cause? Why? You know, Tyson was going through a lot of stuff at that point in time, right? He was having issues with Robin Gibbons, and he was under Don King, and people, whatever, all sorts of turmoil in his life. But was that the issue that he, was that the reason why he lost, because of all the turmoil? No. What he, he even said, he said he lost because he didn't train. The other fights were too easy, so he didn't train. He wasn't equipped. You know, and that's where we can sometimes get. You know, Satan wants us to be lazy. Satan wants us to just feel like there's no opposition. Satan wants us to just kind of go about our daily lives and just do what we want to do, go here and there. But the reality is he's going to come against us. And when we're weak, He's there. He's there to be that opposition. You know, but here's the good news. The good news is God is that coach, that good coach, right? He's the one. He wants the best for his his people. He's going to coach us up, you know, if you people, who, everybody, I don't really like these movies, but if people like the movies where, you know, the, the feel-good ones, you have the coach, like the Mighty Ducks or whatever, you know, where you get this coach, you know, I look at Jordan, you know, <laughs> you coach out this team, and you have this coach who comes in, and he cheers on the team, and all of a sudden, they train, they show a training montage, you know, and all of a sudden, woo, they're great, they win, you know, but God is more than that. He coaches us. He's, he wants us to win, right? He gives us that perfect assistant, the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is there to help us. God knows we can't do it in our own strength. We still have to put forth our effort. We still have to have our plan, our exercise routine, our spiritual exercise routine. But God does give us the Holy Spirit. He gave us Jesus Christ, as our example, right? Not only our example, he sacrificed his only son to pay for our penalty of sin so that we can go directly to the Father. And Jesus, the Holy Spirit, rose him from the dead to defeat sin and death. We have that in us when we've accepted Jesus Christ. Right, so God is not leaving us by ourselves to try to figure it out. He's given us the playbook. He gave us the playbook to victory. I mean, we have it all right here. We just need to meditate on it. We just need to read it. The Holy Spirit is there to help us to understand it, to know it. And in this perfect playbook, God even tells us about himself, who he is. So we can get to know him even more. And then he gives us direct access to him. We can pray. We can, you know, there's nothing wrong with crying out to God and telling him and complaining. God wants us to. He wants us to communicate all of our feelings with him. But ultimately, he wants us to also listen to him and to obey him to understand the playbook to victory so that when the opposition comes, which it will come, we are all to be in, this, in the game. We're all going to experience the fight. We need to be able to react instinctually. We need to be like the professional athlete that when, when they do what they do, it looks effortless. When the outside world sees us, and when that opposition comes, we need to be, at, be able to react instantly. And we don't have to think about it because we know. One last story. I was uh, listening to uh, one of Pastor Greg Rochelle's messages. And he was talking about, you know, there were some people, uh, a group of men who were out on 
Labor Day or whatever, out on the lake on a boat. And a group of men from the church, whatever. And then there's another group, another boat came by. And there was a group of women and men, whatever. And, and one of the women, or a couple of women, decided to flash, you know, take their tops off. And all the men on that boat instantly turned. It was an instant reaction, right? They didn't think about it. They didn't, it was, but it was an instant reaction. They turned, you know? And so the funny thing about it is like, you know, what, what do those girls think? <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden people just turned when they, you know, they want guys to, woohoo, yeah, yeah, whatever. And all of a sudden they all turned and looked the other way. He's like, oh, man, you know, am I that bad or whatever, you know? But the reality is it was an instant reaction. They didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to pause and like, oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, I shouldn't be looking, you know, instantly. What is our reaction when we come up against anything? I mean, we're going to be coming up against more and more opposition as, as we see the world going. So I just kind of want to close on that. You know, we are in a fight. We are to prepare. We are to have an exercise routine. And so as Dana and Mike come forward and they're going to play, uh, I just want anybody who is in the same, God is dealing with them in the same way that God is dealing with me. You know, I just want to give the opportunity to come forward. You know, the altar is not a scary place. If the Lord is convicting you and you know, I have testimony in that as far as coming forward, the Lord convicting me, and I'm holding myself in the pew and not going forward. But if the Lord's convicting you, it's like, hey, this is an area that, yeah, I too need to work on. Come forward and, and just give it to the Lord and ask the Lord to reveal to you what exercise routine you need on a daily basis, what exercise routine He wants to reveal to you on how you can enter into his presence, how you can hide his playbook in your heart so that you'll be ready in season and out whenever that opposition comes. I'm going to kneel here because God is speaking to me, um, but you're more than welcome to come. And after the offertory, uh, Pastor Jonah is going to come up and, and close us out. <laughs>